Well, tonight I want to start with a quiz. It's been a while, and this quiz is going to be a, a Jeopardy-style quiz. Any Jeopardy fans out there? Not that I was, but you know how it works. I'm going to describe a person to you, and then you give me that person in the form of a question. You understand how it works? All right. For example, if I said he was president of the U.S. during the Civil War, you would say? Who was Abraham Lincoln? Okay. Now, the category is not going to be presidents. The category tonight is famous kings from history. My wife always tells me I use too many sports illustrations, so we're going to history. Famous kings from history. Um, and you have to raise your hand to give me an answer. So you've got to be all in the room, raise your hand if you think you know it, all right? All right, here we go. He was king of Great Britain during the American Revolution. Who was King George the? Third, correct, very good, very good. See, right there, King George the Third. I'm sure you recognize him. Number two. He was born in 1754, was married to Marie Antoinette, ruled as king of France until he was executed during the French Revolution in 1793. Give it a shot. Who was King Louis the 16th? Awesome guy right here. That, that, I didn't think anybody was going to get that one. By the way, kind of looks like the last guy. All these kings look the same. Okay, number three. Although an accomplished king in his own right, he is best known as the father of Alexander the Great. If you know this, you come up here and do the rest of the message. Yep. King Philip II of Macedon. That's a correct. Very erudite group. Number four. The, this king's heroic leadership in the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 B.C. made him a legend. Oh, you have to know this, guys. This is the greatest guy king in the history of kings. King Leonidas. Who, I heard that voice in the back. King Leonidas of the Spartans. Right there. You got, you got to let the 300, 300 Spartan warriors who fought off the hordes of... Okay. Number five. Created in 1933, this oversized cinematic primate is best known for climbing the Empire State Building. Huh? What was his name? Pressure. King Kong. Who was King Kong? Now, that's a little bit different kind of king. Trick question. I get that. But tonight, we're still in the story of Jesus. We've moved through his life and ministry. So now we're in a series called Behold the Man. And we're looking at the very last week in Jesus' life and uh, earthly life and ministry. And we're going to see that he was a different kind of king as well. A king, but a different kind of king. We're going to look at Luke chapter 19. And I'm going to read through this story. You recognize the story. We sang a song tonight, Hosanna. The story is of what's called the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And Luke tells it. In fact, it's in most of the gospel stories. But Luke tells it in chapter 19 in a particular way. And we're going to work our way through this story to see what kind of king was Jesus of Nazareth. So beginning in Luke 19 and verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Now I'm going to pause there. Uh, because Jesus has been most recently in the city of Jericho. And Jericho, by the way, is uh, believed to be one of, the, um, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities on the whole planet. Uh, human beings have lived there for up about 10,000 years. A very, very old place on earth. And Jericho um, it was where Jesus had his famous encounter in, in earlier in Luke 19 with a tax collector named Zacchaeus who was known for his small stature and for his uh, corrupt business practices. And Jesus has this interaction with Zacchaeus. Uh, and Zacchaeus does not need to be healed from a physical disease like the leper or like the paralytic. He needs to be healed from a disease of the, of the heart that's called greed. And when he encounters Jesus, he's transformed. And we see his transformation because Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus promises to give half of his wealth to the poor, and then to repay anyone he's cheated four times over what he took for them. He's transformed. We like to say that the gospel transforms people, and transform people make an impact in the world. And Zacchaeus is a beautiful and powerful example of what we say all these centuries later. Now, the city of Jericho is located near where the Jordan River meets the Dead Sea. Now, the area of Jericho is one of the lowest places on earth. It's some 850 feet below sea level. Okay, and Jerusalem is located about 3,400 feet above the level of Jericho. So that's why he says uh, that they were walking up to Jerusalem, walking uphill all 15 to 17 miles to the city of Jerusalem. Now you'll see in the map here, 
where the, the Dead Sea is, that long body of water there. And just at the top in red, you see Jericho, Jerusalem to the west, uh, southwest by about 15 to 17 miles. Now, the road between uh, Jericho and Jerusalem was called the Wadi Kelt. Jeff talked about it a few, couple of weeks ago in one of his messages. A well-known and well-traveled road at the time. You might remember uh, that Jesus told one of his most famous stories, the parable of the Good Samaritan, took place uh, on this, ro- uh, this road. Now, verse 29. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, or the Mount of Olives. I'm going to pause here again. Bethany and Bethpage are like suburbs to Jerusalem. They're villages, but they're kind of like suburbs, kind of like Geneva is to Chicago, only much closer, just a mile and a half to two miles outside of Jerusalem. And both villages are located on what's called the Mount of Olives, kind of a ridge running to the east side of Jerusalem. Now, this is the view today if you stood on the Mount of Olives looking at Jerusalem. Jesus in that day would have had a similar view, sort of a panoramic view of the holy city. Now, Bethany, you might remember, is also this village where Jesus' close friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, two sisters and their brother, lived. And whenever he visited that region, he would often stay in their home. That's the city where, just recently, in the story, Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. So we can assume Jesus is well-known in these small villages and has a great deal of support there because they've seen what Jesus has done. So he sent out two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. Now, this part of the story uh, sounds pretty straightforward. Jesus needs a donkey, and so he sends his disciples out looking for one. He tells them that when they find one, all they need to say is, The Lord needs it, and the donkey's theirs. Now, imagine that in our world today. Uh, donkeys were like the transportation of the day. But imagine in our world today, I had to travel the last couple of weekends and it involved uh, renting cars in a couple of different uh, airports. But imagine uh, in one of my trips uh, when I went that I took one of our staff members with us, let's say, and we got there and I said, hey, just, just, uh, just go down to Alamo and walk onto the lot and just take the first car that you see keys in. And if anybody stops, you just say, Pastor Brian needs it, and you're, they're going to be fine with that. <laughs> if that happened, you would assume that either someone already knew me and had already said, hey, you need anything, it's yours, or I had become so well-known that they just couldn't help themselves. That's a little bit what we see here. We can assume that Jesus says this because um, he's become either so popular in that region that the animal's owners knew immediately who was being referred to by the phrase the Lord, or he had a personal relationship and knew these people from the time he had been visiting in most recent days. Verse 32, So those who were sent away went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, the owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. Now a couple of things here. We need to notice that Luke uh, is taking great care to make sure that his readers, that we see that Jesus is being very specific about this request. He doesn't just want any donkey. He wants a specific kind of donkey, a young colt that no man has ever ridden on before. So he's asking for a very specific thing. Uh, Now, if we're paying attention to the story, we should also be asking ourselves another question. Why does Jesus need a donkey? This is the only time in all the New Testament record that we know for sure Jesus rode on the donkey. Uh, He and his closest followers were not affluent people. They didn't ride on donkeys. They walked everywhere they went. They walked. That's what you did. You walked. It took several days. They knew how long it took to get places when you walked. But he wants a donkey. But he's only a mile and a half outside of Jerusalem. He can make that walk in a few minutes. Why does he want a donkey for the short walk into Jerusalem? Well, we see three reasons at least. First, fulfillment of prophecy. Hundreds of years before, the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 9.9 had written this, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew in his gospel uh, comes right out and says this was to fulfill the spoke, what was spoken through the prophet. And he gives the same exact 
quotation from the prophet Zechariah. So Luke wants us to see that Jesus asks for a specific kind of donkey for a specific reason. He wants to deliver a very clear visual message to the entire city that he's coming into Jerusalem as the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy of Zechariah. He's coming as king. And it's very clear. Secondly, he's also coming in humility. Historians tell us there were two ways for an ancient king to come into a village or a city. If they were coming to wage war, they would ride typically on a horse, on a stallion. A war horse, they would call it. It's how the Roman officials would come into Jerusalem when they were coming to exemplify their power on a stallion. But if a king was coming in peace, they would often ride on a donkey. Interestingly, the Bible tells us that the next time Jesus comes, what Christians call the second coming, the image used in the book of Revelation, we'll get there in a couple of months at the end of the series uh, called The Story of Jesus, uh, the image used is not a donkey at all. The image used is a white horse. Because next time he comes, he will be coming to conquer. He'll be coming as the conquering king. This time, he's coming as the king of peace. He's coming in humility. So Jesus is saying two things by getting on this young donkey. First, he's coming as king. It's clear, fulfilling prophecy. And secondly, he's coming in humility. And third, he wants us to see, Luke wants us to see Jesus' authority. His authority. Luke tells us Jesus instructs his disciples to simply say, the Lord, and in most of your Bibles that's capitalized, the Lord needs it. In applying this title to himself, he's saying something of great importance. It's a title of respect and authority. And applying it to himself, it also has divine connotations. He's saying that he has the authority of a king. That he can use the donkey, even though it doesn't belong to him, because as king he has authority. And as his authority allows him to have everything, everything, in a sense, belongs to him. Now, verse 36. Luke continues, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, and as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, I think we'd have a hard time imagining the scene. Maybe you've seen a movie here or there that's tried to portray this scene. But it's just a few days before the start of the great Passover feast, one of the highest times in ancient Israel. The city is filled with thousands upon thousands of pilgrims. It was a pilgrim feast. You were required to come to Jerusalem to offer your sacrifices, to worship. On top of that, rumors have been circulating for several months about Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. There have been stories of miracles. We covered them in uh, the, re the most recent series. A leper has been cleansed, which was a sign of the Messiah coming. Uh, the paralytic has walked again, also a sign. A blind na na man named Bartimaeus has received his sight. A dead man named Lazarus was called back to life again. And all these miraculous signs were believed to be signs of the coming of God's Messiah. So there's great, been great excitement about his teaching. He said things like, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here now. Some have been saying that he's a prophet. He's a prophet like John the Baptist. Others said, maybe he was the promised Messiah of God. And now Jesus comes riding into town on a donkey, on a young donkey that's never been ridden before, exactly like the prophet, Isaiah, uh, prophet Zechariah predicted. Behold, your king comes to you, said the prophet. So, what would the people be thinking? If you were there in the crowd, that was your backdrop, that's what you knew, what would you be thinking? You'd be thinking, he's here. He's finally here. Hundreds of years of waiting, he's here. The Messiah has come. Our king is coming to us. And what did they think their king was going to do? Set them free from the Romans. The hated Romans, the Gentiles, the pagans who controlled their whole region. He was going to usher in an, an era of economic prosperity, returning Israel to her former glory. They're thinking King David. They're thinking King David returning after a victorious battle. Now think about it for a moment. Isn't that always what we as human beings want from our kings? Isn't that what we always want from our leaders? It's what we want right now. 
I don't know if you're watching the political debates or not, maddening as that is, but we listen to candidates and we want someone, anyone, to give us some sense of hope, some sense that they can deliver us, some sense that they can bring us prosperity. And so here, first century, people lining the streets, they know the prophecies. Here he comes. They know the rumors. They spread their cloaks on the ground, which is what people did in that time to show honor to their king. Now both Matthew and John tell us they did something else, that they cut branches from palm trees and laid them on the ground or waved them before Jesus. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. They sing and they dance as people had done for King David. They're singing Hosanna to the son of David. They're actually singing parts of, a verse of, Psalm 118 in your Bible. That psalm reads, Lord, save us. The single Hebrew word there is Hosanna. That's what it means. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The crowds are celebrating Jesus as king. Now Luke tells us in his next breath that not everyone is excited about this. Not everyone likes what's going on. Verse 39, And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. I believe this sentence that Jesus says is, is a kind of tipping point in the entire story of Jesus. When he says that, it should take your breath away. And here's why. First of all, we see at this moment the crowds are responding to him as if he's the Messiah of Israel. They're welcoming him as if he's king, as if, as if he's King David returning to Jerusalem. Hosanna! Hosanna! Lord, save us! Second, it's significant because we see the opposition to Jesus is rising up. Now, the opposition has been developing for the last several months. John tells us that following the raising of Lazarus from the dead, some of the religious leaders in Jerusalem gathered and they made a decision. We read about that decision in John chapter 11. I'll put some of it on the screen here. Right, let me read this, verse 47. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. This is right after Lazarus was raised from the dead. What are we accomplishing, they ask? Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do, not, you do not realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. We're going to see Caiaphas again in the next couple of weeks. Verse 57, But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. That's a hint about what Judas is eventually going to do. Now, I think it's sometimes easy for us to kind of assume that the chief priests and the Pharisees are sort of the, the villains, the bad guys in the story. We just write them off as evil. They didn't get it. But think a little bit more about that for a moment. Imagine if right now, in the middle of this presidential race, as much like a re reality show as it is, um, imagine that right in the middle of this race, a group of people started the impromptu campaign. Let's say it starts right now. It's late in the game, right now. And the campaign is for a brand new candidate. And let's say this candidate uh, happens to be a former mechanic from Batavia. He's only 30 years old. He's got no political experience. Didn't even graduate from college. His only work experience is working in a blue-collar job in his father's shop. And his supporters are saying not only should he be the leader of the nation, they're claiming that he's the long-lost relative of Abraham Lincoln. And therefore, he should be our next president. Now, what would you think? We'd be going, okay, uh, this Race is already a little bit weird. You expect us to believe that now? You expect us to follow this guy? Well, Jesus is threatening to the powers that be for three reasons. He was threatening it because he wasn't what they expected. He didn't look like a king. He was a carpenter from Nazareth. He didn't act like a king. He had dinner with tax collectors and prostitutes. He didn't talk like a king. He said things like, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. And he was becoming way too popular with the common people. Thousands were flocking to him just to hear him teach. And he was willing to confront their hypocrisy. 
On more than one occasion, he said things like, Now then, you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. And no one likes to be confronted about their own sin. And thirdly, we see that Jesus allows himself to be worshipped. And this is the key moment here. This is the tipping point. Up to this point in the story, you may remember that on a number of occasions, Jesus has actually warned his disciples not to talk about his miracles. He's warned them not to make him more known. He's gone to lonely places and prayed. He resisted an attempt to make him king by force. He did not want to be popular. He didn't want people to follow him just because of the miracles. He stayed out of the limelight. Now, he's intentionally fulfilled the words of the messianic prophecy ridden on the young donkey at Passover time. He's positioned himself as king publicly. He receives the praise and worship of the crowd And not only does he receive their worship, he says, if they keep silent, the rocks themselves will cry out. Dramatic change. Why? Because it's time. Up until now, he said, my time is not yet come. Now it is time. It's time for him to reveal who he is, why he's come, and what he must do. What we need to see here is that Jesus is carefully orchestrating this entire event to accomplish his purposes. He knows this is going to force the enemies he has to deal with them because the time is now. Verse 41. And when he draw near and saw the city, remember that panoramic view? He's coming down the Mount of Olives. He sees the city. He wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. The story takes a a distinct turn right here. The crowds are celebrating. It's a joyful parade, and Jesus is weeping. The word used here means to sob, to wail aloud, an uncontainable, audible grief. Why? Shouldn't Jesus be happy? Isn't this the pinnacle of what he would be hoping for? The crowds are praising him. They're saying, Hosanna. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about Jesus' grief? When Lazarus died, before he raised him from the dead, remember that? Jesus was filled with a a grief and a kind of holy rage at the death of Lazarus, his great enemy, sin and death in the world. I think we're seeing something of the same thing here. Jesus weeps because while the crowds celebrate, he knows they do not yet fully understand who he is. They celebrate him because of the miracles. They celebrate because he's become kind of a celebrity of sorts. And as human beings, we love celebrity, don't we? Even to this day. They celebrate because they think he's come to liberate them from Rome, to be the next King David. Many historians point out that the palm branches were an ancient symbol in that time in the world of revolution. They were a symbol of victory. They were saying, we think you're going to lead us to victory. We think you're going to get rid of them. But he's come for something far different, something far greater. He's come as the Lamb of God, as the final sacrifice for the sins of the world. He's come as the King who will make peace on the cross. It's interesting that some Christian traditions, and some of you may have spent a number of uh, years in these traditions, begin the Easter Lenten season by, by burning palm branches and then taking the ashes and making the sign of the cross. That's what's happening here. Jesus is transforming the meaning of a king from victory and military conquest to sacrifice. He's a different kind of king. 
Jesus weeps because Jerusalem will not receive the peace he offers. Ironically, the word Jerusalem can be translated as city of peace or city of completeness. And Jesus weeps because he knows Jerusalem will not be a city of peace. Rather, the city will be destroyed. And history tells us the Romans utterly destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, just less than 40 years later. Jesus weeps because he knows that within days they will reject him. Some of the same voices who said Hosanna will say crucify him. And Jesus weeps. He weeps because he knows the cross is coming. Not only because he will go to the cross, but because the cross itself is necessary at all. So, several questions. Who is Jesus? Who is he? The whole story of the triumphal entry is orchestrated by Jesus himself to tell us who he is. He's not a prophet come to say things about God. He's not a great teacher come to teach us about spiritual things. He's not one among many on the Mount Rushmore of religious spiritual characters. He's coming as King, capital K, as the King to whom belongs all authority and all glory. And most importantly, if he is King, it means I am not. And neither are you. And that's the point of the story. How many of you have seen the movie Risen yet? Seen it? Let me just say, if you haven't seen it, don't be afraid of it. It's a great conversation starter. It takes a great take on on the story. Uh, It does fair justice to the biblical narrative. And I don't want to give it away, uh, give the movie away to you, but when the pagan Roman tribune, who is the center of the story, finally sees the risen Jesus, he's not happy. He's terrified. Why? Because if that's true, it changes everything. If there's a king and it's not me, it changes everything. That means I am under that king's authority. It means everything I have belongs to him. And sometimes that doesn't feel like good news at first. Jesus was a threat. Jesus was a different kind of king, but he made no mistake. He is king. Secondly, if he's king, what kind of king is he? What kind of king is Jesus? Did he come to usher in military and political power? No. Did he come to liberate Israel from the Romans? No. He didn't come to coerce. He didn't come to destroy. He came to bring peace, a particular kind of peace. He came to serve. He came to sacrifice. He came to offer himself for the sins of the world, a different kind of king. And the third question we have to ask is, if he is king, is he your king? Because that's the question. Everyone has a king. Everyone has a king. We may not call it a king, But every human being who's ever lived has worshipped and served something in their lives. We all worship and serve something. Your king might be your career, your work. Your Your king might be your wealth, your money. Your king might be your family or your children. It might be pleasure or entertainment. But you do have a king. Ask yourself if you want to know who your king is. Ask yourself. To what or to whom do I offer my extravagant devotion? When you have that answer, you'll know your king. Ask yourself, on what or on whom am I depending to forgive my sin? When you know the answer to that, you'll know your king. Ask yourself, around what or around who do I orient all my life and my priorities? You'll know your king. Ask yourself, in what or whom am I hoping to find eternal life? You'll know your king. Tim Keller pastor in New York City says it this way, you cannot have Jesus without accepting his rule. You cannot have Jesus without accepting his rule. A lot of you will recognize this name, but S.M. Lockridge was one of the great preachers of the 20th century. Uh, He preached at a church in San Diego, California for 40 or 50 years. And way back in 1976, he preached a sermon that became his most well-known sermon. It was called Seven-Way King. I'm sure some of you have heard a little six-minute 
section of this sermon on YouTube or on the internet somewhere. It's called That's My King. We've played it here at church a number of times. If you've never heard it, search it out on YouTube, S.M. Lockridge, That's My King, and listen, because I can't do it justice. But as a portion of his sermon, here's what he says. The Bible says he's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. That's my king. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. That's my king. He supplies strength for the weak. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meek. That's my king. Do you know him? He's the doorway to deliverance, the pathway to peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway to glory. That's my king. Do you know him? Well, that's the question. Do you know him? Would you bow with me tonight as I close with a prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight for your word and for this dramatic story that many of us have heard since we were children. But help us to hear it in a fresh way. Your entrance into the great holy city so long ago. We too want to be among those who hail you as king, but the only way to know you as king is to surrender to your rule. It's to surrender to your authority, to surrender to your grace. May we always remember that you are a different kind of king. The king that came first to serve, first to sacrifice, First to bring priest, uh, peace and salvation, and then to rule. And so may we honor you and honor your reign in our hearts and in this, your church. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.